My job as a geneticist, as I will make clear during this lecture, is to make sex boring. So prepare yourself to be bored. The essence of my talk is shown in this slide here, which is, of course, a very beautiful painting of Adam meeting Eve. Now, that is the story of human origins that was believed for thousands of years, uh, and that we did literally appear on Earth as men and women um, at some time in the not-too-distant past. If you actually take the figures that are in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and add them up, as an Irish um, historian once did, it turns out that the day of creation, when Adam met Eve, was October the 10th, 4004 BC, which was a Thursday at half past 11 in the morning. Um, not many people believe in the literal truth of that story, at least not on this side of the Atlantic. In the United States, if you make an opinion poll, something like 150 million Americans believe that that's actually true. As I said to my American publisher, I don't mind if those people burn my books as long as they buy them first, but they haven't shown much sign of doing that. I don't propose to talk about the arguments about creationism because to me they're just boring arguments. You cannot discuss creationism because people who believe in the literal truth of, uh, of the Adam and Eve story are denying science. Many years ago, I taught for a year in the African country of Botswana in southern Africa, um, which is a very nice place. And it has a very strong Christian Protestant tradition and a very strong history of literal belief in creation. And I taught a course to 100 or so African students about human evolution. And at the end of that course, I asked one of the students, how did he manage to reconcile, to put together in his mind, what I'd been telling him about humans having appeared perhaps on Earth 150,000 years ago, with what he believed from the Bible? How could he believe in both? And he looked me straight in the eye and gave me a very nice smile. And he said, the answer, sir, is perfectly um, straightforward. You evolved, we were created. That's, that seems to me the perfect answer. It seems pretty odd then that an evolutionist can talk about Adam and Eve. But, if, but in fact, there was an Adam, certainly, a male who is the ancestor of us all, and there was an Eve, a female who was the ancestor of us all. And we can actually trace the mutant genetics in a way which I hope I'll be able to explain to you. So what I want to talk about in this, um, in this lecture is what does it mean to be Adam or to be Eve, to be male or to be female? How can we trace the history of males and females? And finally, did Adam and Eve ever meet? So <clears throat> it's a way, genetics is a, way, a new way of studying evolution. And human evolution, of course, began, as I'm sure you all know, with this chap here, Charles Darwin. And, of course, he founded an enormous number of things, um, the study of human evolution uh, included, with his book of 1871 called The Descent of Man. And the, I've stolen his title in my new book and call it The Descent of Men, um, which, for the reasons I hope, will become, will become clear. The question which... The 1871 book caused a great uproar because it made it clear that we were, as human beings, just uh, descended from other creatures. Darwinian man, though well behaved, is really but a monkey shaved, as was, as was once said. And we are, of course, we all know that we share 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees. We are mammals. Uh, it's worth remembering, perhaps, that we share 40% of our DNA with bananas. So 98% isn't that impressive. Um, but we are clearly mammals. But we're also something special. We're more than mammals. We're humans. But we can learn a lot about what it means to be, um, to be a mammal. Now, if, what you need to know to understand Adam and Eve is what it means to be male or to be female. When I was thinking of writing this book, The Descent of Men, I um, typed into Amazon.com the word masculinity, maleness, to see if anybody else had written a similar book. And that's what you can now do. Um, and a thousand titles came up. And uh, I thought, oh, well, there's no point in writing a book about males. It's all been done. But then I began to look at those titles, and they were rather strange. Some of them, <coughs> were, about half of them were written by women. Um, some of them were biological in tone. Uh, Man and Other Reptiles was one. Some of them are more psychological. 
if men could talk, what would they say? And some of them were almost impossible to understand. One was called The Penis Book, an owner's manual, and the author was Margaret Gore, who was a woman, of course. So I, be I began to think that there is perhaps room for a book on the science of being male. If you type my name, Steve Jones, which is a very common name, into the internet, you get lots of hits. And this is the first guy you get, um, Steve Jones, who is a bodybuilder in the United States. Um, uh, as one of my students said to me, have you not been well, sir? Um, and he's extremely heavily built, extremely fierce. I have to say he looks rather stupid. So that's what males are, big, tough, and stupid. And females, women, are exactly the opposite. Well, there's an element of truth in that. But it's only a very small element. Certainly it applies to some creatures. Um, uh, I suppose the, the mammalian equivalent of Steve Jones is this creature here, who is an elephant seal. And what the elephant seal does, that's a male elephant seal, and what it does, it spends most of its time, the males, fighting each other to attract the females. And the males in the elephant seal are five times bigger than the females. And in human terms, that's equivalent to a normal a uh, woman having an affair with the world's fattest man who died um, weighing half a ton. Only one in five makes it to be adult because they're killed by other males. And only one in 20 has any offspring at all because only the dominant males succeed in passing on their genes. Whereas all the females in elephant seals survive effectively and they all have children. So that clearly is a difference between males and females. Males, as Darwin argued in his book, are often very aggressive and showy and the females choose the best males. So in some senses, that's what Adam and Eve actually were. But that, um, and that sense is actually quite a deep one because even to be a human male is quite risky. Males in humans and in elephant seals are filled with a particular hormone that's called testosterone. And we know a lot about testosterone. If you inject it, uh, you'll turn into Steve Jones, or at least you'll turn into the Steve Jones on the screen. Uh, bodybuilders tend to use a lot of testosterone, and if they use a lot of testosterone, they can become violent. Um, more than half of all bodybuilders who die, die in car accidents, in uh, fights, or from heart attacks, which are brought on by testosterone. Here's the patterns of de life expectancy from, the age of, from birth to the age of 80 years, for men in blue and women in red. And you can see quite clearly that the rate of mortality deaths per 100,000. As you get older, there are more and more of them. There are very few when you're young, but as we get to this embarrassing age, which I am, they increase, and men do much worse. Men, in fact, live on the average about six years uh, less than women do. But let's look at some of the details. Some of them are pretty obvious, okay? Here's murder. Men both murder and are murdered uh, much more often than women are, uh, okay? And the peak is around the age of 20, when just like elephant seals, the males, the men are looking for mates. So that's the testosterone talking. Men are killed in accidents more than women. Interestingly enough, men are even killed by lightning more than women are, okay? There's a gene for death by thunderbolt. Why should that be? Because men go and climb the tops of mountains or they go out on golf courses with lightning conductors in their hands, and they're killed. And most interesting, men are actually killed much more by parasites and by infectious disease. So why should that be? Now we know that testosterone actually works extremely well to switch off the immune system. The immune system is our defense against infection, and if you've got testosterone, it, it doesn't work nearly as well. Uh, there was an experiment that showed the power of maleness of testosterone in making us take risks and be infected that was done in the United States in the 1930s. In the 1930s in the US, rather shockingly now, many thousands of young boys were castrated. They had their testicles removed for absurd and outrageous reasons, for petty crime or for mild mental illness. These people were, uh, their male organs were removed, and many of them were kept in institutions for all their lives. And they've been dying off. Most of them, I think, are dead now. The average difference in life expectancy of a castrated young man, a young man with no testosterone, was 13 years longer than that of a normal, unmutilated young man in the same place. And that's a huge difference. In fact, the average life expectancy of somebody who smokes 60 cigarettes a day, which even in Poland is a lot, 
okay, um, is only five years less than somebody um, who doesn't smoke at all. So having testicles is twice as dangerous as smoking. So give it up immediately, I would say, before it's too late. So clearly, it is that image of males as big, stupid, risk-taking, and not very healthy is actually fair enough. Um, but it's not universal, because it certainly isn't the case in general that males are the big sex, the, the arrogant sex, the dangerous sex. There are plenty of instances where exactly the opposite is true. My favorite example of this is a fish called the anglerfish. Now, the anglerfish, uh, many of them were thought for some years to be asexual, to be all-female. And there are plenty of fish that are all female. They just produce eggs without the benefit of males. A few years ago, somebody who was a British biologist was dissecting one of these big sea, deep sea fish and noticed some rather embarrassing spots on the fish's backside, on her posterior. You look a bit closely and they turn out to be the males. These are the, this is the female, this big creature here. She's a meter long. These are the males which are coming sidling up to her, sticking on and being reduced to a bag of guts and genitals. What more, one asks, could any male want? And in the end, these will be reduced to be little tiny bags of sperm attached to the female, and when she feels like a mate, she'll choose one of them and use the sperm. Okay? And that's a classic case where exactly the opposite tr is true. The female is the big aggressive partner, the male is a pathetic wimp. So simply being big isn't the answer to being male. It's a bit more subtle than that. Okay. Well, of course, there's also a genetic definition of being male. Um, that, that is, males have a particular chromosome that's called the Y chromosome, which is only males have, and uh, females have two X chromosomes. The male Y chromosome is a reduced version of the, uh, of the X. And that Y chromosome has just been sequenced just about six, seven weeks ago. There was a paper in the journal Nature which gave the complete DNA sequence of the human Y chromosome. And uh, it's kind of embarrassing for us males because it's decayed and it's redundant and it's parasitic. It's full of garbage and junk and it doesn't do anything and it lies around all day and it doesn't have any sex. Um, it's, very, it's a very male kind of chromosome. It's only really got one, kind, one, important, uh, one important gene on it. There have been several genes that have been said to be on the Y chromosome. One of the classic genes that was supposed to be on the Y, trans transmitted from father to son, and not to daughters, was a gene for hairy ears. If you look in old-fashioned human genetics textbooks, you will always see this picture as a gene on the human Y chromosome. Well, it's always struck me as a bit dubious, but when I was in Africa once, I was walking through the streets of Johannesburg, and I saw an African chap with enormous points of hair coming out of his ears. So being a geneticist, I went up to him, and I said, excuse me, I hope you don't mind me asking, uh, is there anybody else in, this, in your family who has this condition? And he said to me very politely, oh, yes, there is, sir. My mother does. <laughs> so this, this, this gene is not on that chromosome, okay? However, one gene is, and that's the crucial gene that makes males male. And SRY, as it's called, is the male sex-determining gene. It was first analyzed in my own laboratory, not by me, I have to say, um, about 10, 12 years ago now, um, people took this gene from a male mouse, uh, inserted it into a female egg, an, an, into an egg which is supposed to make a female, a, daughter, a female mouse, and that mouse developed as a male. So the gene is very, very simple. It switches the developing embryo from being female to being male. It's only got a very limited number of units in it. I'm sure you all know the famous code of DNA, which is A, G, C, and T. Um, but there's another code, which you may not know so well, and this is the code in which biologists describe the amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. They have letters like M, Q, S, Y. And what you can do is you can read along the DNA and work out what the amino acid code is, and you get to somewhere where it begins to read as if it's making something. These are various amino acids. Usually, you have no idea what a particular gene is making. In this case, actually, very fortunately, the gene told you what it did because it actually spells out male. It's the, uh, it's the male sex-determining gene. And we know a lot about it now. It's been uh, sequenced, and it doesn't do very much. This is rather an old uh, three-dimensional model of the protein, which is the protein, which is the male-determining protein. And it, all it does is to bind onto the DNA and to bend it slightly. 
And it works only in the first three weeks or less of development. After about three, until about three weeks, a human embryo can be either male or female. Then this gene switches itself on if it's there, and the embryo becomes male unless it, anything goes wrong, in which it goes back towards being female again. It's a bit surprising that a little tiny gene with a very small protein can have the dramatic effect of turning people into Steve Jones or into males. Um, but it's a bit like, I suppose, a railway journey. If you take a train from Warsaw to wherever, to Gdansk or Warsaw to Lvov or whatever you want to be in Poland, um, what happens is as you leave where, not wherever you want to be in Eastern Europe, um, <laughs> What happens is, as you leave the station, the, uh, the guy in charge of the uh, railway system will pull a lever or press a button, and a little railway point will go up from here to here, and the train will change its direction perhaps by thousands of kilometers. And that's exactly the way that this sex-determining gene works. It works like the points outside a railway station to move the giant locomotive of development from one destination to another. So you don't need very much to become male. Once that switch is done, then all the other depressing things about being male rather than female actually happen. So maybe that's what it means to be male rather than be female, to have a Y chromosome. And as we'll see, Y chromosomes in humans are very useful in searching out the history of Adam rather than Eve. But in fact, that doesn't work either, because there are plenty of creatures that manage to be male without chromosomes at all. The, my favorite example in that, again, comes from fish. There are lots of, lots of ways of being male. Some creatures, like um, alligators, let's say, um, the males and the females only appear because, because if you incubate the eggs at different temperatures. For some, uh, for some of those creatures, warm eggs mean males, cold eggs mean females. Uh, for some, my favorite example comes from fish. There's a particular fish that lives in North American lakes where you have b one big, brightly colored male and a group of females and it all looks very straightforward. If you take the male away, uh, then naturally there's some chaos for a while, understandably there's no male there. Then one of the female begins, females begins to look a bit shifty, a bit dubious, a bit dishonest, and she turns into a male. And she turns into a fully functional male who makes sperm. So that's sex determination by social pressure, by embarrassment. It doesn't need chromosomes at all. And in fact, there are many, many creatures that can become male or female without genetics. It can be done by temperature or by social pressure or by other things. So even that doesn't work. So what is the universal definition of being male? In fact, it's very simple and it's very straightforward and it happens throughout the living world, both from animals and from plants. There are two sexes, one of which makes lots of small sex cells, that's the males, and one of which makes a few big sex cells, and that's the females. And that's the only definition which works for absolutely everything. The figures are, uh, are, really, are really quite impressive. Every time a human male has sex, he makes enough sperm to fertilize every female in Europe. Uh, that there are a million liters of semen made by human males every hour, which is impressive. Well, I thought that's a lot of, that's a lot of sperm to make. Um, if you write, as you will know, you like to have metaphors. So I said that the human male population in the world makes a million liters of semen an hour, which is equivalent to the flow of the River Thames at Westminster. Okay? And that's quite a big river, as you can see. Well, I put this in the manuscript of my new book, um, <coughs> and <coughs> it got to be the print stage, and that's when you begin to think, I'd better check some of these figures. So I thought, well, is that right? I'd better write to the Thames Water Board, the people who who are in charge of the River Thames. So I wrote saying, is it the case that the flow of human sperm is equivalent to the Thames at Westminster? There was a long silence. It took about three weeks. And this letter had clearly gone all the way up through this uh, organization. It still had got to the managing director. And his letter came back and said, we have had many complaints about water quality, <laughs> but never this one. Um, however, your sum is quite wrong. Um, <clears throat> A million liters of semen a day is only this much, which is the River Thames about two kilometers from its source. So we don't make as much as we might think. However, it is an awful lot of cells. In fact, every second in the world, throughout the world, the men of the world make 200,000 billion sperm. And that's a lot of sperm. Think about it. That's a lot of sperm. Every second, 
the women of the world make 400 eggs. And every second, four children are born. So that's a huge difference in the, in the strategy, reproductive strategy of males and females. Thousands of millions of cells from males, tens of cells from females. And that's what differentiates males from females, Adam from Eve. 